for, for the first time, I went to Svalbard in 2008. That's like 11 years ago. And since then, I've been traveling there every year. Uh, I've been setting up the equipment for different projects. Uh, I also downloaded data from different instruments that I installed in the field. And today, I'd like to share my knowledge on uh, how we deal with the equipment in the Arctic. So the main objective of this lesson is just short introduction, how not to do it, uh, ruining equipment, how not to ruin your stuff. Uh, this will be just short overview over different possible risks and equipment failures when uh, you conduct field work in the Arctic. First of all, I have to say it's really expensive to go to remote places such as uh, to the Arctic. So you spend lots of time in preparation, then you uh, spend lots of money on traveling, you spend lots of money usually for the equipment, and then you uh, install it, you keep your fingers crossed, but once uh, you are prepared to go there and you are sure that your equipment will work, uh, you can be calm and just expect your results after some time once it's collected in the field. But first of all, you have to decide which equipment you need. So making and using equipment requires knowledge and experience because it has to work correctly. Uh, once it's in the field, once you install that, you already spend a lot of money uh, from your projects. That's usually not your private money, but that's the money that comes from uh, different institutions, uh, from your government. And after your project, you have to publish uh, your results. If you will lose your equipment or if it won't work correctly, there will be no publication and you will have problem. So you have to do everything to av avoid such situation that you won't get any data from your equipment. Uh, of course, there are many uh, different research programs that can be put at risk. Usually, simple and uh, simple equipment failures can be avoidable. You just need the knowledge before you go to the field. And of course, during this presentation, I won't give all the answers for, uh, for the problems you may have in the field, but just to show you what kind of problems I met during my field work. Uh, yeah, that, that's the main topic of this lesson. First of all, I usually go to Svalbard, that's uh, high Arctic. As you can see, that's the location on the map. Uh, that means it's far north, it's far from Poland. Wh whenever I go from Poland to uh, so far, it's kind of expensive. First, I spend money on tickets, I spend money on shipping. Uh, and of course, on the equipment that I prepare for different projects. Uh, but before I go, before I apply whatever I, uh, before I set up the equipment in the field, there is the rule in Svalbard. All scientists who conduct research in Svalbard must familiarize themselves with all applicable regulations. And that means that there is general rule. All the field activities require a permission from the governor of Svalbard. That means that all the installations that I plan, I need to uh, write them to the governor and, and get the permission. So that's some application that I prepare. Uh, in this application, I just write what kind of equipment, uh, how will I mount this equipment in the field? And of course, what, what is that for and what uh, I want to obtain from uh, the data collected? There is a research in Svalbard database, RIS. It contains information about research and monitoring projects in Svalbard and surrounding waters. If you go to this website, you can, uh, for example, read some of my projects. Some of them are ongoing, some of them were finished. And that's something that allows scientists to um, just describe what they do and to get permission because you submit your application to the governor of Svalbard via this website. Uh, another thing in the field is that uh, there is rule in Svalbard that uh, for polar bear protection, you must always uh, have the rifle if you go outside the settlements. That means whenever you go out from a longer BN, 
you need to carry a rifle just for the protection. Uh, polar bears are protected, you don't want to use it, but just for self-defense you need the rifle and you need to know how to use it. In the very beginning it's always fun to have a rifle with you, you know, it looks nice on the pictures, but trust me, uh, carrying rifle for kilometers, wherever you go, it can be up to the uh, mountaintops uh, or to the glaciers, it's not comfortable, so after let's say kilometers you are really not happy that you need that but it's necessary to have it uh, what can happen to the equipment first of all the equipment will be exposed to low temperatures freeze thaw cycles because there will be freezing and thawing uh, the temperatures above zero and below zero there will be melting ice strong winds grid blasting that means sand particles in the air uh, there is also a possibility of salt crystallization because there is water vapor from the fjord uh, and in the water, uh, water vapor you can find little crystals of salt from the fjord and that's something that can also influence your equipment. And there is also strong static electricity. So before you go to the Arctic you need to check uh, and prepare your equipment and to know what can happen, you have to check the variability of atmospheric conditions and rapidly changing weather. There will be weather cold and windy, but there can be also warm day. So this variability of air temperatures of different precipitation will influence your equipment. Another thing is cold water. Cold water from precipitation, melt water and uh, cold water in different reservoirs, uh, such as in fjords or rivers or lakes. Uh, you need to know where you want to set up your equipment and how you want to do it. Because carrying all the stuff in your backpack and walking long distances, that's something that you have to consider. So if you have, for example, batteries that uh, can weigh up to 20 kilograms, there won't be uh, many more things that you can take with you. So, or you have the group of people that will carry stuff in their backpacks, or you use different means of transportation, such as rubber boats or snowmobiles, or you go on skis. That's something that you have to consider before going to the field, because you will need to carry it to different places. There is, of course, limited communication network. There is no mobile phone, uh, phone connection uh, outside Longyearbyen. Uh, there are different glacial and slow processes, such as avalanches. Uh, what else can be met by your equipment? Polar bears and other wildlife that will just be interested in your equi equipment. So you want to uh, prepare it before it will be destroyed. And of course, these small mistakes and problems can lead to the equipment damage. If you're uh, not prepared enough, if you forget just a little thing uh, from your equipment, it's always a problem if you're in a remote location because you won't go to the shop in the Arctic. Uh, that's something that you already bought in the continent and you uh, brought it with you. If there's little thing missing, you're in this problem. And of course, if there will be any problem, you may, uh, may waste uh, your effort and money that you invested in your research program. Uh, so that's something that you really want to avoid. You, uh, trust me, the feeling if you expected data to, to be uh, downloaded uh, and then you go to the field and something doesn't work, it really sucks. But the first thing you should do before going to the field is testing and verifying all the equipment you have. What you do is making sure that your equipment works. You check the cables remain flexible in uh, low temperatures and the enclosure, so whatever you put uh, into, uh, like all the instruments need to be protected, so you put uh, them into some enclosures. Uh, they need to prevent the moisture or grease. Uh, the thing is, you shouldn't rely on the equipment manufacturer's claim about the operating temperatures. Before you go to the field, you should check it, before, uh, because it's 
easier and cheaper to check it in Poland, for example, in my case, than going to the Arctic and then relying on what was written. It's, that's something that has to be checked before. Uh, so you need to verify the correct operation and fix any deficiency of your equipment before taking it for the expensive uh, field trip. In Svalbard, there are different seasons. Uh, so for example, if you uh, have some battery and solar panel, you need to know that during winter time, there, uh, the, the battery won't be uh, charged by solar panel because uh, there is a dark season, no sun will uh, charge your batteries. Uh, during spring and autumn, uh, these are just short transition periods. There's lots of snow. So that's also something that you have to consider. The ideal way uh, is to have someone in the field to go, to go there and check the equipment. It's possible at Polish Polar Station, Hornsund, uh, and its surroundings, because we have stuff that works there throughout the year. But whenever uh, we set up equipment in a remote location, uh, different remote locations far from the station, that's something that will stay alone and maybe someone can go there just from time to time. But usually we leave the stuff for whole season or whole year. That means, for example, for hydrological measurements, we install the things in the beginning of ablation season and then we go back to collect the data at the end of the season. Uh, season. There's, uh, it's not possible to have person in each valley where we have uh, different equipment. So from time to time, you just go there, but they need to uh, work alone. Something that you should consider, as I mentioned, is the temperature variability. Recently, we observed that uh, winter is rather warmer, but there's still temperatures around minus 8, minus 10 degrees. And during summer, the temperatures are uh, less variable, but uh, around plus 5 degrees. That's, uh, da uh, that's the daily mean for each day. And here uh, is the daily data from 1979 to 2014. So you can see the variability of temperatures. Uh, so for example, during January or February, during winter months, you can have temperatures from minus 30 up to plus three degrees. So there will be this freezing and thawing cycle. And that's something that uh, will influence the equipment, of course, because you will have melting and freezing. There's also strong winds. Uh, in Hornsund, we recorded uh, wind gusts up to 180 kilometers per hour. So whatever you leave in the field, it has to be uh, hard enough uh, and stable enough to uh, not be blown by such strong winds. I can show you a short movie from uh, one campaign a few years ago, I was with my colleagues, and we wanted to drill uh, boreholes in the glacier uh, using steaming drill. So we just needed to boil the water and then using this rig, we just uh, put the rig in the ice and this boiling water is melting the ice. But for boiling, we needed to use matches. And as you can see, it's not possible to light the matches in such conditions. So there was plan to conduct, uh, to set up uh, the instruments, the mass on the glacier. But this day, it was just not possible because we couldn't light the matches. So that's an example that can happen in the field. Even though your equipment is prepared, sometimes it's, you're not able to use it. Just one match can ch change everything. Yeah, so we struggled to uh, light uh, the boiler with hot water, but we just couldn't. So we resigned after some time because of strong wind. Uh, strong wind also influences the conditions uh, when there is very dry air and frozen ground. Uh, it results in large amounts of static electricity. So your equipment uh, ha can instantly dis be uh, destroyed if it's unprotected from uh, static uh, electricity. So that's something that's also uh, necessary to check if your ex equipment can survive st static electricity. Uh, 
yeah, there will be, of course, lots of snowfall and stuff like that. So wh whatever you have in the field, if it will disappear under the snow, it depends. If it's, for example, uh, wind uh, anemometer, so the sensor that measures the wind speed, if it's covered with uh, snow, you won't use it. There will be no data from such thing because inside the snow cover, you won't measure anything. But first of all, before you go to the field, you need to prepare yourself. You think, of course, about the equipment, but you, your health is the most important and whatever you do, you, uh, you need to come back in one piece. So you need to prepare yourself. Uh, you should uh, have clothing adapted to different seasons. Uh, of course, the clothing should be windproof and waterproof. Uh, but you need to bring additional clothing for extreme weather conditions if it's necessary. For example, I showed you different uh, temperatures during winter. So your shoes and clothing must be big enough to fit extra insulating layers. Wherever you go, if you walk, you can warm up. But wherever you stay and stand and just uh, fix your equipment, set up mass uh, and instruments, it will be cold. So you need extra layers. If you carry the stuff in the backpack, it can be heavy, you can walk up the mountains, so you will sweat. But once you stop, you will be cold. So extra, extra layers of clothing, uh, and it's better to have uh, more layers than just one thick uh, layer. Because once you sweat, you will be wet underneath, and you, you will be cold. And actually, there's no single piece of wonder clothing. There's no such thing. So... Uh, you need many layers and different stuff depending on what you do and where you go. Uh, important thing is to bring extra mittens and extra hat because if it's windy and one of your gloves can be blown away by wind, you can use the extra mittens. If you don't have it, you have problem. Your shoes should be stable uh, and strong. Sometimes you need uh, rubber boots if you cross the rivers. And you need, of course, uh, headwear and gloves. I mentioned before the extra pairs. So these extra layers are something really important. Wherever you go, wherever uh, you think you know where you're going, uh, you can expect low visibility. If fog appears or if you go high up on the mountain, uh, there can be cloud coming. So fog that uh, touches the ground and you'll have low visibility and you'll have problem. That's why we always have with us map, compass and GPS just to know the exact location where we are. For example, this is picture uh, of my colleague when we were setting up the time-lapse cameras. Just a few moments before the cloud came to the mountaintop and we couldn't see anything but white uh, around us. Uh, we also have uh, emergency beacons, satellite phones, and VHF radios, just to call for help. Uh, and what dangers can we meet in the field is, for example, glaciers. 60% of Svalbard is covered by glaciers, uh, and all of them are potentially dangerous because there are crevasses, meltwater channels and moulins, and different local conditions. If the glacier is covered with snow, there is higher risk because you cannot see the crevasses. They can be covered by thin uh, layer of snow, and that's something that is really dangerous. If it's bare ice, it's easy to see the crevasses, so you can uh, just put your crampons and jump, uh, jump over them. Uh, for the safety on glaciers, we use different equipment, such as uh, ropes, crampons and ice axes. So that's something extra, not only measuring equipment, but also safety equipment that we carry with us. I already mentioned the rifle. Now you can see what's extra in our backpacks. And of course, we need to keep away from calving zones. We, uh, we don't go too close to the glacier front because there is calving. So the huge block of ice can fall down into the fjord, so uh, if you are if you're on the rubber boat or whatever boat, uh, don't go too close, it's dangerous. 
but we do measurements in the fjords, so we just keep uh, some distance around 200 meters from the front of glaciers. I already mentioned the, uh, I mentioned the equipment for rescue on glaciers. That's an example of crevasse that uh, was covered with snow. As you can see only part of it, uh, of it uncovered. So that's something that you need to have in your mind. If there's snow on top of a glacier, it's not safe. Uh, there's, of course, slope hazards. There's no paths in Svalbard, no routes for uh, tourists. Wherever we go, we need to check the route. And uh, on slopes, it's uh, rather unsafe, but we try to find the safest way to go up. But that's something that you need to have in your mind, that there can be rockfall, landslide, or snow avalanche if there is snow on slopes. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and usually, uh, because there's no uh, paths, there's loose stones that can uh, fall at any time. So we, uh, when we go up the slopes, we take helmets and gloves, just in case, uh, proper hiking boots, which are stable, and we walk carefully. We rather not run in the field. Of course, if there is a possibility to avalanche to appear, uh, especially during springtime, we take with us avalanche probes, metal shovels, and uh, receivers for avalanches, rescue beacons that we put underneath the, uh, under the, the top layers. And before we go to the field, we test the weapons, flare guns, and all the pyrotechnical aids uh, before the trip. That's an example. My colleague uh, gave me this rifle after taking picture of some flower. Uh, so you shouldn't trust your colleague if he says that everything is okay. Uh, this rifle had to be cleaned before I used that. When we set up camp in the field, uh, we use trip wires. That's something that we put around the camp we stretch the wire and uh, f at fixed, uh, fixed points there are trigger mechanism. If, for example, polar bear walks through it, this will explode and give us uh, some time uh, to prepare ourselves for, uh, for protecting ourselves from the polar bear. When we cross rivers and valleys, uh, and there are many water bearing valleys in Svalbard, uh, the permafrost keeps the water from draining deep down into the ground, and that means that water can spread uh, all over the valley, and it makes passage really difficult. Uh, water that goes down from the glaciers, so outlet, uh, yeah, the glacier rivers are uh, brown, so it's not possible to tell how deep is uh, the river. So you always need to be careful. You can see. Uh, my colleagues here on the picture, they carry a uh, GPS receiver. That's pretty expensive stuff, so always carrying expensive stuff needs uh, special care, well, whatever you do and wherever you go. And something that you need to know is that water flow in all rivers, <clears throat> especially glacial rivers, may vary drastically within hours because there will be melting snow. Here are two pictures actually taken in the same place. Uh, that, that's the same river, but you can see how melting water uh, changed the level of river. So whenever you cross the river, you need to consider if there will be possibility to go back. Uh, that's a picture of my colleague that fell into a uh, river channel on top of the glacier. Uh, that was really Mm, dangerous because it was slippery and we helped him take uh, took him away from this supraglacial uh, stream and he was really happy that he had the uh, expensive equipment above him he was just uh, carrying the expensive sensors in his one hand and struggled with the other hand to go out from the stream uh, whenever we go onto the sea ice, we take with us ice cloths and heaving lines, uh, and we prepare ourselves uh, for 
bad conditions. So whatever, uh, the weather can change at any moment. Wherever we go, we take more fuel with us. We take also uh, tents and extra food just in case if we uh, will spend more time than expected in the field. And something that we always have in our minds during springtime, you know, there is polar day, uh, good uh, weather conditions, but uh, when we go on snowmobiles, one hour drive, but it's not really true, it can be even 15 minutes drive that you will have to walk back one day on foot. If your snowmobile breaks, if you have just one snowmobile, if you're alone, walking back to the base can uh, last long, long hours. Uh, wherever uh, we go around the fjord, we take more fuel than we expect to use. So we estimate the fuel burn. We take, for example, two tanks, but we always take extra fuel just in case because in different weather conditions, uh, especially on the fjord, if you have bigger waves or short uh, waves uh, wind made, uh, the consumption of fuel will be higher than expected. So you just need more than you think you need. Uh, when you're wearing uh, the rescue suit, you have to zip it up always just to get ready to ice load in the sub-zero waters because you never know. Uh, you can go pretty fast on rubber boat, but you can hit, uh, for example, uh, some pole or whatever can float in the water. It can be uh, some ice, uh, it can be some rock, it can be some wooden pile. Wherever you go, you just prepare yourself in case if you fall into water, uh, a rescue suit will uh, help you to survive. Uh, the thing about the equipment is there are electrical cables and metal wires in cables are rather unaffected by the cold. But the plastic covering around the uh, cable uh, can become rigid and shatter in the cold. So before you go to the field, as I mentioned in the beginning, just check if your cables will uh, remain flexible and usable at low temperatures. Uh, the most common insulation for cables is uh, PVC plastic, but PVC below minus 10 degrees, uh, it's really easy to break it. So we rather choose rubber insulations uh, or fluorocarbon insulations like Teflon, because uh, these uh, and also silicon insulations are usable even below minus 60 degrees. All the loose cables and uh, wiring looms can cause equipment failure due to vibration if there is windy conditions. So we just need to make sure that all the loose cables uh, and the wiring looms are well secured with cable ties. So that's something that can happen with your equipment. There are always some electrical cables. You need to protect them. Here is an example of a meteorological station that we installed. Uh, and you can see how all the cables are secured and how the meteorological mast is mounted in the ground. We uh, use lashings around the mast. These are drilled into uh, rocks. So this remains stable and we put some extra rocks just to make it more heavy and more stable, just to protect it uh, from flying away when the wind will be uh, strong. Uh, I mentioned about uh, rubber casing around the cables. That's something that should work, but actually doesn't because of the wildlife. Here you can see the reindeer that started to chew the cable. And these guys, polar foxes, they really like to chew on cables. So we put some extra uh, protection uh, around the cables. On the picture you can see uh, there is special casing, the metal part, in which the, the cable is put inside so uh, that the animals won't chew on the uh, steel protection around the cable. Uh, on the picture you can see a flow meter that is installed uh, nearby the Polish Polar Station. And for that, we just put the instrument in the river and the cable is... Uh, that connects the logger with the sensor is protected and we put always 
uh, all the sensors in, uh, and also loggers in special casings. But there's not much we can do when this guy appears. Uh, whenever we see polar bears near our equipment, we are really worried and we try to just scare them away, shouting, screaming or whatever uh, we can do to, to scare them away. Polar bears are very uh, intelligent animals and they really like to check whatever they can see in the field, whatever, if it's must or anything, they, are, they will check if it's stable, if it's uh, hard enough, if it can be moved or not. And in some situations, even our most stable masts that, uh, that you know, protect our equipment from strong winds, they cannot be protected from polar bears. So sometimes we lose our stuff uh, because of these guys. But I mentioned about the rifles in the beginning. We only use them to protect ourselves, not to protect the equipment or measuring equipment. Uh, only if uh, the polar bear would uh, use the equipment that's really necessary for our survival, we can use the rifle. For example, if we are somewhere far, far away and we are relying on our snowmobile because we don't have any skis or stuff, we need to scare the bear away from the equipment. But that's something that uh, quite often happens. Polar bears just come, just check the equipment, and sometimes they just destroy it, and that's not much we can do about that. Uh, for protection against moisture and grit, we use waterproof cases. As you can see, uh, there is loggers and instruments that we put inside this casing, and this uh, just to avoid uh, the water vapor that would condense uh, to water or ice inside the equipment. So it won't be damaged if it will stay inside such casing. You need to make sure that enclosure uh, for your electronic equipment and all the plugs and sockets uh, uh, are watertight and uh, remain so at low temperatures. So that's also something that you need to check before you go to the field. Everything has to be stable, waterproof and windproof. A uh, few words about batteries. All types of battery uh, have reduced performance in the cold. They go flat faster and have less uh, ability to deliver electricity in the cold. I believe you know it from your uh, everyday life. If you use your smartphones uh, during winter, the batteries are uh, going flat uh, faster. But there's something you can do. Just put it in the uh, inner part closer to your body and protect it from the outside conditions. And that's something that we also do uh, using the casings that I already showed. They also have some, uh, these waterproof cases, they also have some insulation from the uh, temperatures uh, above. And you need to make sure that you're using batteries that are suitable for the temperatures that you will en encounter uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and you need extra chargers and stuff. And the ideal way is to have someone to go to the field and uh, change the batteries or charge the batteries. But sometimes, in, as I mentioned, remote locations, it's not possible. So the equipment stays, stays alone for uh, long months. You, uh, you need uh, special batteries and from those the best ones uh, because uh, they can survive uh, and are usable even uh, up to uh, minus 40 centigrade are lithium batteries. That's something that you can have in your mind. If you want to uh, do measurements, use your equipment in the cold, the lithium batteries will be the best. Uh, it's better not to use carbon zinc batteries. Uh, here uh, you can see my colleague that is changing the uh, battery uh, inside the meteorological station on the glacier. If you have someone in the field, this person can also clean the sensors, remove the ice because there can be ice uh, on, on top of different sensors. But sometimes it's not possible to have someone, so uh, we try to use the heating systems for the instrument, so they get rid of ice. 
Uh, about the displays, uh, some measuring equipment, uh, actually recently most uh, instruments have uh, display on it. LCDs might, uh, might not work at all in the cold or their response will be slow because they will freeze. This is liquid crystal display, so this liquid crystal will be frozen. Uh, uh, LED light emitting diodes are better. They work fine at low temperatures, but they might be hard to read in very bright, glary sunlight. And that's something that you also need to consider. You should, uh, you, we prefer matte display monitors in your laptops. For example, here I have instrument, yeah, that's uh, logger and sensors of uh, ground temperatures. When I read out this uh, logger, I go with the laptop to the field, and if it's sunny, the matte display monitor is uh, much more convenient to use because you can see something on the display. Uh, about the ec uh, optical equipment, all the lenses uh, or window uh, on the equipment may be rendered uh, useless by moisture in the form of condensation, icing, or hoarfrost. So that's something that you also uh, try to avoid. Maybe you can have someone to clean the uh, glasses and lenses. Uh, if not, you need some protection, so uh, some, uh, maybe some heating to get rid of ice. All the equipment uh, that you take uh, to the field should be, yeah, you should consider ergonomics of it. Can you operate your equipment in the field? Can you carry it with you? Uh, will you be wearing uh, heavy mitts or gloves? So anything with small buttons and knobs and screws. I showed you the movie with, when we tried to uh, light the match. It wasn't possible to do it. So sometimes the uh, conditions don't allow us to go. Uh, so sometimes we just ch uh, check the weather forecast and wait for better conditions. But once you are ready to, uh, to go to the field, uh, just uh, Think about carrying all the stuff that you need. Maybe you uh, uh, should ask some extra people to go with you. You can always discuss it with your friends and other scientists. Maybe they can help you. If not, you need to go twice or more times. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, there are different fields of uh, uh, scientific measurements that we conduct in Hornsund. These are listed here. So for each of them, there's different uh, scientific equipment used, and I'm not able to show you everything that I uh, want, but just to give you some glance on the equipment we use. For example, for rin uh, river runoff, we use uh, electromagnetic meters. Uh, we also use ground penetrating radars just to see the structures of the ice underneath the, the GPR uh, shows us what's going on in the ground or or in the uh, snow or in the ice. So we use uh, snowmobiles or we just walk with this radar and on the chart you can see uh, the structures that were measured uh, underneath the antenna. Uh, another equipment is drilling rig. This one we use for drilling boreholes. I showed you this instrument. This is thermistor chain with sensor at different depths. It's just a uh, line with sensors at different depths. So last year we drilled uh, some boreholes up to 20 meters using this drilling rig. Uh, there was also compressor. You can see it uh, on the picture uh, on the left side. The compressor was blowing air just to blow away the sediment uh, during drilling. And then we put the logger same one as I am showing you here, in the ground. And uh, I'll be back to collect the data in June this year. So after a whole year, uh, we will know what's going on uh, in case of uh, ground thermal regime. We also set up piezometers. Uh, the, this one is presented on the chart and on the picture. Uh, these are for uh, measuring the water table, uh, groundwater table. So what's going on in groundwater? What's the level of it? We also use drones in the Arctic just for mapping purposes. 
And there's also acoustic voice when we do measurements uh, in the fjord, different uh, flow meters, just to check the, the uh, runoff from glaciers. And there's lots of different equipment used in the fjords, like sounds for measuring the temperatures and salinity, sediment traps as shown here on the pictures, and also profilers, just to give us information how the bottom of the uh, fjord looks like. And actually, there's lots of different equipment that uh, I could show you, but I don't think there is time for that. Uh, it's already 43 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And I hope that I just showed you a glance and now we have some ideas how, how it is to struggle in the Arctic to do some measurements and uh, how hard and how expensive it is to get the data uh, and then that's the data that we collect and then we, uh, the scientific work is dealing with the data and publishing the information that we got from different instruments in the field. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, write them in the chat box.